I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Hispanics are at home in the Diocese of Immigrants. I see them as a blessing, a big blessing, a blessing for the city of New York, for our country, a big blessing for our church. It's not the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but the stars have all been there. This is where they can come and be like anyone else. And our Ask the Doctor makes a house call that just might save your life. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us this Tuesday. Well, if you want to know where the immigrants in this city of immigrants are coming from, all you really have to do is listen to the language many of them are speaking. Indeed, it is Spanish. And it's uh, Hispanic Heritage Month this month, and we wanted to take a closer look at their contributions to our community. So our own Natalia Ortiz is here. She's got the second installment of her series on Hispanics and their faith. Natalia? Thank you. Hispanics are becoming a growing and important presence in Brooklyn. If you want to know how important, listen to this. According to the Pastoral Planning Office, Hispanics make up about 50% of Catholics in Brooklyn. And that led us to ask, what's their story? So I decided to find out. Latinos. They add a touch of rhythm, passion, and liveliness everywhere they go. And the Diocese of Brooklyn is no exception. Though the Hispanic presence today is difficult to ignore, it wasn't like this once upon a time. There was a uh, two strong waves of migration of the Puerto Ricans after the First World War, actually, and then after the Second World War. Again, there was another large migration of Puerto Ricans into the Diocese of Brooklyn. When the Hispanic population was small, so too were the Hispanic services within the diocese. Lisette Morales recalls what it was like almost 40 years ago. There was a lot of uh, Irish, Italians, and most of the masses, like my mother said, were in English. If they had one or two in Spanish, it was a lot. So that's how my mom learned English. In an attempt to reach out to the Spanish language Catholics, the diocese encouraged priests to learn the language and the culture. It also began offering a retreat created in Spain called Cursillos, meaning mini course, which has connected many Hispanic Catholics to the church in their new city. The Spanish started to come and they needed their atmosphere and also their language. And therefore, the Cursillo uh, filled a vacuum. Still, in the 60s, many Spanish language masses were held in basements just like this one, even though those masses were often better attended. So uh, people had started to become very uh, annoyed about this, that they still were considered like second-class mm -hmm. citizens by having the mass downstairs. There were petitions against me because I was Hispanic, without knowing me. Even more surprising, the first head of the Hispanic apostolate wasn't even Hispanic. He was an Irish-American priest named Monsignor John O'Brien. Finally, Hispanic Catholics in Brooklyn decided they had had enough, and in 1974, they voiced their concerns during a diocesan conference. So that when this conference was convened, the Monsignor O'Brien, who was the first Hispanic Apostolic Director, started speaking. A gentleman who had been a very active leader in the community came forward, came up the stage steps, and pushed aside Monsignor and began to speak about the, uh, the grievances that Hispanic, people, that Hispanic people had. So then Father Valero became the first Hispanic to direct the Hispanic Apostolate. Today, much of the Puerto Rican community that led the change has assimilated and moved on, as well as the few Cubans who arrived in the 50s. Monsignor Thomas Healy is pastor at Our Lady of Sorrows in Corona, one of the parishes in the diocese with the most Hispanics. He says the 70s and 80s brought Dominicans and Colombians, but other Hispanic groups continue to arrive and sprinkle the diocese with their Latin flavor. And I would say the largest group now would be Ecuadorians, and after them Mexicans, and then Dominicans, yes, and then, then bits of everything. Just as many predict Hispanics will soon be the majority in the U.S., they also expect they're the future of the Catholic Church, not just in Brooklyn and Queens, but in the nation. I see them as a blessing, a big blessing, a blessing for the city of New York, for our country, 
a big blessing for our church. That was Monsignor Healy of Our Lady of Sorrows. Next week, we'll profile this parish and show you the large role it plays in the Hispanic apostolate in Brooklyn and Queens. Be sure to watch. Francesca and Mac, back to you. All right, Natalia, thank you very much. And uh, Hispanics are actually becoming more vocal about health care reform as well. We'll have that and the rest of the day's headlines when Currents returns. And Hollywood gets ready to tackle one of the most controversial popes of the 20th century. You see the, the movie and you can say it's true or it's not true. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Coming up a little bit later, Dr. Steve Garner, the Nets' very own Ask the Doctor, pays us a house call. But first, let's have a look at all the day's headlines. Well, as we just heard at the top of our show, Hispanics are a growing presence in the Diocese of Brooklyn, and at least one Hispanic leader is adding his voice to the health care debate. The president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference says requiring immigrants to prove citizenship before purchasing coverage is a de facto endorsement of racial profiling. Well, the president of the U.S. Bishops Conference sounded a similar call on Tuesday. Cardinal Francis George says the church doesn't support illegal immigration, but says people who've been living in the U.S. for decades should be able to do so with security. The Group of 20 Summit will be held in Pittsburgh later this week. The G20, as it's known, brings together leaders from major industrialized and developing nations to talk about economic issues. Ahead of the G20, though, there's a gathering of another sort, as religious leaders come from around the United States. They'll all come together to call on those leaders to help people suffering because of the global economic recession. More than 25 Christian, Jewish, and Islamic leaders from the U.S. are gathering today and tomorrow. The two-day G20 summit begins on Thursday. John Lennon once sung, Imagine No Religion. But for a growing number of people in the U.S., that's actually a reality. A study out of Trinity College in Connecticut shows the number of Americans who don't practice a religion is steadily rising. The lead researcher says in 20 years, it's possible one out of every five Americans will be non-religious, and that could outnumber Catholics. A local woman who dedicated herself to a religious life may be on the path to sainthood. The Diocese of Matucha, New Jersey has sent the Vatican its review of a possible miracle from the intercession of Mother Mary Angeline Teresa McCrory, who died in 1984. A local couple prayed to the late nun after being told their unborn child would have a birth defect. When the baby was born, the defect was not as severe as expected. While some nuns on the Upper East Side are not Gaga over Lady Gaga, the popular singer, formerly known as Stephanie Joanne Angelina Germanotta, attended the school at the Convent of the Sacred Heart, and some of the sisters caught her act last week on the MTV Video Music Awards. Lady Gaga came out in a bizarre costume that was then splattered with fake blood to evoke what she says was the death of her private life following her increasing fame. A suicide prevention group has said that her skit romanticized suicide. The New York Post reports when the nuns were shown a video of her performance, they were not amused. Well, those nuns may have a better review of a forthcoming movie about Pope Pius XII, but as we hear from Rome reports, the subject of Pius has generated its own controversy. Pius XII is one of the more studied popes of the 20th century. Fate had it that his papacy came about during one of the most difficult times of the last hundred years, World War II. Seventy years later, scholars around the world are still debating just what Pius's role during the war entailed. Oscar Clemente is convinced that the Pope played an important role in saving Jewish lives during the war. So much so that he's making a movie about his life. We are in the middle of a big fire because the Catholics say yes, the Jewish people say no, it was not true. What I can do is uh, only let people decide if it was or not. Clemente is the producer of the film Pope Pius XII a $45 million project currently in pre-production stages in the United States. Because he wanted to convey an accurate portrayal of Pius XII, Clemente has read and analyzed over 150 texts in the pontiff, including documents in the Vatican's secret archives. 
every single piece of the movie as a, a little, uh, you know, a light in somewhere. So we, we read something in the book, original book, we read something in the original papers that the, the Pope wrote in that time, and we make all together, and we made a film. Making a film around the sensitivity of the Holocaust is not an easy thing. For decades after his papacy, his legacy was debated. Some said he didn't do enough to save innocent lives. Others, like Oscar Clemente, think otherwise. We leave the people understand what really we want to show them. So, you know, you see the, the movie and you can say it's true or it's not true. And I want just to tell the truth that this is my point of view. Though there is no set release date for the film just yet, Oscar and his team hope it'll be no more than a year and a half before their film on one of the more influential popes of the 20th century hits the big screen. And in related news, there's an effort underway to have Pius declared righteous among nations, the highest honor bestowed by the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. Well, stay tuned when Currents returns from Pius XII and Hollywood to the Great White Way. <laughs> this might look like theater, but it's actually a Broadway church. Well, when you mention names like Bob Hope, Loretta Young, Don Amici, Rudolph Valentino, <laughs> you often think of Hollywood. But we didn't have to travel across the country to see where those stars once shined. In fact, they and a lot of other Catholic performers worshipped at St. Malachy's Parish in the heart of Times Square. It's still a popular place for actors to pray when they aren't in a play. That's right, and it even has its own actor's chapel, as a matter of fact. Well, last night I paid the church a visit as it held a special service to bless performers of all kinds in the artistic world. At St. Malachy's Church in Manhattan's theater district, artists of all types have long been a big part of the congregation. But as pastor Father Richard Baker says, it hasn't always been that way. Malachy's was established as a regular Roman Catholic parish. It was when Broadway moved up, the theatrical uh, district moved up around it. And uh, Catholics naturally, of course, went to their local church, those people involved in the uh, Broadway theater. And uh, so thus they uh, dedicated um, a special shrine here to St. Genesius, the patron of actors. And so from that point on, St. Malachy's has had a unique place for the um, actor to come and feel very much at home. Over the years, the church has been the parish home of some big names, but Father Baker doesn't like to brag. Certainly the famous funeral of Rudolf Valentino was celebrated here back in, in, in its day. Um, there are, have been many, many uh, famous actors and actresses that have come here, but primarily uh, we are a, a church where everybody can come and be equal. So even if they did come, I wouldn't tell you, because this is where they can come and be like anyone else. But a lot of artists do call the church home, and last night was the blessing of the artists, a night to honor actors, dancers, choreographers, writers, painters, and artists of all kinds. It's a give back, you know, we, the, he gave us the talent. Why don't we share it with everyone? And at the same time, thank him for giving this to us because, because this talent is what makes us who we are. So we had May play the violin and she was awesome, I thought. So we want them to be part of the service because this is their church. It's their celebration. poem that was read, which is I Am Music, and a feeling of that we can feel at the beginning overwhelmed by outside forces and things that come to you, but if you listen to the music in your heart, if you listen to what God has to say to you, you'll be okay. It'll calm you. And there weren't just different art forms represented, but different religions too. Rabbi Jill Hausman from the Actors Temple sang the 23rd song.
As a longtime actor and singer myself, I appreciated the church recognizing that talents are a blessing and a gift from God. And for those who are obviously gifted artists, the service of blessing has a deep, profound, and personal meaning as well. It's my chance to thank God for the talent that he gave me, uh, for me to be able to use it in no other way except to honor, to adore, in adoration. So it's my give back. That's what it is. It's my thank you. I see how important it is for us to pray for the people in the entertainment community and the artistic world and to show them the support of the church. Um, God is the first artist in his act of creation, and the artist himself, as John Paul II reminds us in his letter to artists, is the one profession that best reflects God in his creative action. Well, it was so much fun last night. And St. Malachy's is such a beautiful parish, too. Yeah. Inside, it's a little different, huh? Yeah, it is. It's actually kind of laid out. The, the, the pews are like at an angle, and they all kind of go toward the center of the chapel there. It's really neat. I like what you just said about God being the original creator, you know, obviously, yeah. and, and that uh, all these creative arts are then, you know, sort of blessed inherently uh, by God and, and whatnot because, you know, obviously he's the big creative one. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, you know, sometimes it was really neat, too, because sometimes you go to a church to a parish and you know you'll sit there during mass and you'll hear people kind of skittishly singing or mm. maybe kind of you know a little embarrassed to sing so none of that last night they let it, it was out. everybody was singing loudly and mm. it was it was great and dancing in the aisles and all that kind of good I stuff I know <laughs> dancing in the aisles of the catholic church How and that? and you know it's funny cuz that connection to broadway we're actually giving away some tickets to the 39 steps one of the broadway shows right. here at the net as well so uh, if you head that way and you want to go check out St. Malachy's you might want to you know go check out that play too absolutely they're all right there nearby we'll win them for free here right and I've also written about uh, a little bit more about the service at St. Malachy's last night on our blog. Just head over to CurrentsNY.net, click on Riding the Wave. It's right there in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Stay tuned. There's much more current straight ahead. The doctor is in. We'll speak with a man who's been a mainstay on our station. It's become really a joy, and I, I hope it's, it's good for the people. Well, finally tonight, for countless viewers over the years, there's been one reliable place to turn for what ails you. Got a question about some ache or pain? Just ask the doctor, the Nets' own Dr. Steve Garner. Well, he's beginning his ninth season here, and so we asked him to make a house call here at Currents. So we stopped by. I actually had the chance to meet with Dr. Garner last week, mm -hmm. and we talked about his career on camera and off. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Garner. Welcome to Ask the Doctor. We're in the midst of a health scare, the swine flu. With me, I have Dr. Marguerite Sina. What can we do for you? I was wondering if there are any side effects similar to prednisone that I should look out for. Because the SVT is, in general, is benign. There are multiple problems going on at the same time. It's actually about the entire continuum of your health. Kelly, I hope that helps. And joining us now is the doctor himself, Steve Garner. Thank you so much for being here. We Thanks. appreciate it. First of all, I want to learn a little bit about you and uh, how you became involved with uh, the Ask the Doctor show. Well, you know, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn all my life, and my family's from Brooklyn, so we always loved this area. And there was a show, and I was chief medical officer for the St. Vincent Catholic Medical Centers, and we had invested in a analysis slot in medical ethics call-in show. Right. And after the only call we got was a wrong number one night, we said, well, this is not working <laughs> out. It's a great topic, but maybe not right. what people want to talk about. And it was right around 9-11 as well. Mm. So we said, what if we, um, I came by and met John Kelly, who was one of the legends of this show. Right. He's no, unfortunately no longer with us. Yeah. I said, John, what if we were to put together something where the people can call in about problems that are bothering them? Maybe they're afraid to ask their doctor about it. Maybe it has to do with anthrax. And he said, ah, that won't work. But <laughs> <laughs> after that enthusiasm uh, response, <laughs> what we did was we said, John, give it a chance. So we did it the first night, and we started getting some phone calls in. It was amazing. It was, they started trickling in, and John said, let's give it another shot. And we did it the next week. And by the next week, the two of us were like on the same wavelength. I loved working with him, and we had such a great time. The phone started getting busier and busier, and people started recognizing now in the street, you know, oh, aren't you the, the doctor that told me about, you know? So it was very exciting. It was very nice. But I never thought it was going to go eight years and extend into all the boroughs like, like we've done. Yeah. And 
And we're still in the same studio, which Where I could started. talk to the bishop about. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, we're very happy to be over there. Yeah. And uh, we've gotten to be family now. It's like people are part of the Ask the Doctor family. They watch at 3 in the morning. We have insomniacs. In the yeah. group, so <laughs> right, right. But they like to watch it late at night. And it's, it's become really a joy. And I, I hope it's, it's good for the people, too. Well, good. Well, great. Oh, yeah, Ask the Doctor insomniacs. Yes. It's a <laughs> medical condition in and of itself. Right, right. They've got to <laughs> become news anchors in the morning. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We could have Ask the Doctor Insomniacs and start a morning show of our own here. Right. No, but, um, uh, okay, so, so you've got the show. And basically, tell me a little bit, uh, for those who may not have seen it before, a little about the format of the show. I know that you, you take calls and you have guests on as well, right? Right. It opens up with a little uh, monologue, sort of like Ala J. Leno type thing, yeah. but, but not as funny. But, uh, <laughs> but its topic is not. But we talk about in the news. So swine flu, for example, would be in the news now. Yesterday was a story about cancer patients not healing as well if they were depressed. So right. we have to treat the whole mind. And then we introduce three doctors of varying specialties. So we always have three doctors from around the city. And um, then we tell them what they do, like a pain management doctor yesterday. Who would, be of, who would use that pay person? And then all of a sudden, the lines start coming in. We have little things, sidelights, like a quiz, because to avoid Alzheimer's, actually, if people who do quizzes and crossword puzzles have a decreased chance of getting Alzheimer's or forestalling it. Wow. So we have our own little version, a quiz. Last night, which is the only state that didn't have a 100 degree temperature or more in the United States in history. Yeah. And nobody guessed Hawaii, which it was, but it's a tropical climate. So people, and then we give them a plaque, which are hanging on several walls. So we have, we try to make little games out of it, but the purpose is to get the health information out. So we could do that by making people interested in the show, asking where they eat. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with health, yeah. but it relaxes them a little bit. You feel part of, you know, you, c you can ask the doctor now, you know, tell me about this problem I've been having. And we, people are not afraid to talk about the most intimate of topics. That's why we have a seven-second delay. Right. So <laughs> there, there you go. Well, that yeah. helps, too. you got to do that when you have callers. Right. Yeah. Um, what, uh, maybe just very quickly here, uh, or maybe one of the, the more interesting uh, questions that you've had or topics you've talked about. I think... Um, this th I had a woman whose husband died, actually, had a CPR, ha had a cardiac arrest in the house, and she froze. And she just said, is there any way, what could, what's, what's available? She had taken a course a couple of years earlier, and wh when he died, she got so nervous that he c she, she couldn't do anything. And she wanted the people out there in the audience not to have that same experience. And fortunately, there, is, there are some things, some improvement in teaching CPR, which right. no one could ever remember. You go to a course, what is that, 10, ten blows to the right. mouth? So I'm going to show you something actually that people can use at home where 80% of these cardiac problems occur, right. cardiac arrest. But well, that, that was an interesting question. Okay, well, very good. Well, let's do that now, shall we? Love to. Let's do okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, Doctor, usually I am the biggest dummy in the room. <laughs> but we've got uh, this here uh, to, to show us a little bit of a demonstration about yeah. something that someone might actually see on the yeah. show. Yeah, you know, about 80% of people who have sudden cardiac death, it happens in the house. Mm -hmm. And people are often at loss. What do I do if that happens? I took a course of a couple of years ago. Who remembers, you know, 10, 10 presses to two blows? That can all be very technical, what, what yeah. you learn in those courses. So I want to show something that will not only relax you, but anybody can do this procedure. Okay. And so, God forbid someone in your house has passed out, mm -hmm. just as this person. You see, your look is not breathing. There's a simple thing you could do. Now, okay. you take your hands, you put them one over the other, okay. very simple. It right in the middle between the two breasts. And interlock the fingers. Interlocking the fingers. Okay. And then press down with your weight of your body. Okay. Now, the question is how many compressions in a minute? It goes to the song Staying Alive. It happens to be the right number. So yeah. let's just, I'll give you an example. Live, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Live, 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 live. Now, you can keep someone alive for 30 to 40 minutes until an ambulance arrives and save that person's life. Wow. So most of these cardiac deaths occur in the house. It'll be a member of your family that you're saving. Yeah. And this is a big change. Now, somebody's going to say, how come you didn't, you didn't blow into the mouth the way you used to? Right. It turns out you don't have to. There's enough oxygen in the body that you don't have to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth compressions. And actually, people who did mouth-to-mouth -mouth compressions had less Less positive results. Wow. The people didn't survive. Okay. Can you see them? Sure, sure. Let's see if you can do let that. Let me try now. this here. Okay, so put the, the palm right there and then right. interlock the fingers. Right. And then get and relaxed then and then. Live, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Live, live, live. Now, live. takes your yeah, mind see, off it. Right. And, and you're, you're not so nervous. And the, the only thing is, don't get too into it and start dancing. Oh, you don't. Know, and Matt, and, <laughs> and don't, don't say, oh, I, does the, how do you mend a broken heart? It doesn't work. You know, right. how can you? It doesn't work. So <laughs> not quite the same right, thing. So what we want to do okay. is live, and so, so, so to stay alive, well, that's uh, easy to remember. I mean, who cannot do this? And if you come across somebody in the street who you don't know, you may be reluctant to mouth to mouth in this day and age. Right. You don't have to. 
It's okay. a beautiful thing to save a life. Well, very good. Okay, one more time. Uh, what uh, time is the show on and what days? Oh, you know what? It's Tuesday nights, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so right after Currents on Tuesday Right nights. after Currents, one of the best shows. All ever. right. Well, great. well, Dr. Gardner, thank you so much thank for you. being here today. We really appreciate it. Good to see thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Our very own Dr. Steve Gardner there, a, a, a great guy. <laughs> and actually, if you have something that you'd like to ask the doctor, don't touch that remote. He'll be on immediately after current tonight and every Tuesday night right here at 8 o'clock. Be sure to check it out. Also on his website, he's got plenty of features there. A new interactive forum as well. Just head over to netny.net slash ask the doctor. Nicely and, uh, done. Yeah, thank you. It's, <laughs> it is easy to remember, though. You know, well, you sure, want to keep somebody catchy. alive, staying alive. You just do the thing. It's. it's I, nice. I was surprised though that you don't have to do the mouth to mouth part anymore. I didn't I know, know that. Yeah, there yeah, was. Yeah, kind of gross. I had read. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, you know, they <laughs> pr had provided like uh, at certain places they would have like, the CPR kit with yeah, the thing, the mouthpiece sure, thing. But, but you know, now knowing that you don't really have to do that at all. All you need is the Bee Gees, and you're fine. Exactly, <laughs> which is true for so many areas. Of life. Well, he's been on for so long. I'm so <laughs> glad he's on right after this show like Matt said so check it out for yourself that is all for this edition of currents coming up tomorrow learning wisdom from those who came before us you'll meet some special members of the african-american apostolate right here in brooklyn but until then remember you can always catch us online head on over to currentsny.net and you can see clips of the show there and you can also check out our blog it's called riding the way and you can also follow us on Twitter. You can see what we're tweeting about at twitter.com slash currentsny. And for all of us here at Currents, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.